A very good evening to all of you. This is Business Today, your weekly business roundup brought to you exclusively on Channel I. And today is 2nd of August 2017. We have entered into a brand new month and we hope this month will bring you peace and prosperity that you richly deserve. And with that wish, we will start our show for tonight with Business Personalities segment. Yes, would you like to have a cup of tea? And many would say, yes, of course, at any given time of the day. And this is one of the most commonly used phrases in Sri Lankan community throughout many generations. And the business personality who's joining us today is representing the supreme authority on Ceylon tea. Let's look at the introduction to welcome our guest. Rohan Pathiagoda is the chairman of the Sri Lanka Tea Board the state institution that regulates the tea industry and promotes Ceylon tea across the world. He is a man of many parts. Having graduated from King's College, London with a degree in electrical and electronics engineering and done his postgraduate research in biomedical engineering at the University of Sussex, he joined the Ministry of Health and rose to be Director of Biomedical Engineering Services at the tender age of 27. There he made his mark as a competent leader, and manager not only by uplifting the quality of technical services across the government health system, but also by joining with the army to establish casualty care services in the north as the war against LTTE terrorism developed between the civil emergency of 1983 and the arrival of the IPKF in 1987. For his services to the nation he was in 1987 awarded the Vada Marukchi Medal by President J.R. Jai Wardana. While serving in the Health Ministry Mr. Pethiagoda was also appointed concurrently the Chairman of the Water Resources Board. In 1988 he resigned from his government positions to take up an offer to work in the private sector, which gave him the freedom to function part-time in biodiversity research and follow his childhood hobby the study of fishes. In 1991 he published his first book, Freshwater Fishes of Sri Lanka, which soon became a bestseller. He then diverted the royalties from that book into the Wildlife Heritage Trust, a charitable foundation he created to fund biodiversity research in Sri Lanka. The trust was able to provide funds for research and exploration activity across the country, focusing especially on lesser-known groups of animals. This work served to uncover more than 150 new species of animals endemic to Sri Lanka, species whose very existence had been until then completely unknown. In 1998 he purchased a 50-acre tea estate in Agarapatana and moved the growing collection of specimens his research was accumulating to a special laboratory there. This became a new focus for biodiversity research, used by university students and local and international scientists. Struck by the large-scale loss of tropical montane cloud forests in Sri Lanka, he then turned his attention to testing the possibility of converting tea plantations back into native high-altitude forest. It was an initiative that won him a Rolex Award for Enterprise in 2000, and an experiment that continues to this day, now almost 20 years later. Meanwhile Mr. Pethiagoda went on to author more than 60 research papers in international journals, in addition to a number of books, on various related topics, these have included, titles as diverse as the amphibians of Sri Lanka, a history of biodiversity studies in Sri Lanka, and the flora and fauna of Horton Plains National Park. He is an avid reader of science, with deep interests in economics, history, biography and anthropology. In addition to being a keen science writer, and outspoken commentator on science and liberal values. Mr. Pethiagoda's services have been widely sought by agencies, both in Sri Lanka and overseas. He has served as an advisor to the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources and the Ministry of Tourism, and been elected a Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. His international appointments have included, being Deputy Chair of IUCN Species Survival Commission, 
Deputy Chair of the $5 million British American Tobacco Biodiversity Partnership, a trustee of the International Trust for Zoological Nomenclature, a committee member of the World Commission on National Parks, a member of the Global Amphibian Specialist Group, and, currently, a member of the high-level group that oversees the global environmental outlook process of the United Nations Environment Programme. He has been offered but declined numerous presidential awards for science, on the grounds that the pleasure of discovery is the only reward he seeks for his scientific research. He continues to take time out to mentor gifted postgraduate students in the biodiversity sciences, having served as a visiting lecturer in conservation biology at the Postgraduate Institute of Studies of the University of Peyra Deniur. He is also a lead editor of Zoo Taxa, the world's largest international peer-reviewed biodiversity journal, and serves as a research associate of the Australian Museum in Sydney. Apart from his scientific interests, he continues to nurture numerous corporate interests, and has made his mark as a much sought after and sometimes controversial public speaker. In October 2015 he accepted the offer of the chairmanship of the Sri Lanka Tea Board as a special challenge in the background of both his father and his maternal grandfather having been pioneer tea planters. In that role, he has been an outspoken champion of the private sector's role in serving as the sector's engine of growth and also vociferously advocated lessening the regulatory burden imposed on the industry by the state, arguing instead for greater freedom, for the industry to regulate itself. Now, almost two years into the job, there is scarcely any aspect of the industry on which he does not have a strong opinion. Yes, he is our... Uh Mr. Rohan Pityagoda, and he is the chairman of uh, Sri Lanka Tea Board. A very good evening to you and a very warm welcome. Thank you, Ms. Andrew. Right, so uh, year 2017 is quite a special year for Ceylon Tea as we are celebrating 150 years. So in uh, 1867, when James Taylor planted uh, the first crop in Sri Lanka, he wouldn't have ever thought that this would become one of the most uh, popular exports. So let's start our conversation by talking a little bit about the glorious history of Ceylon tea. As you said, when James Taylor started yeah. uh, planting tea, uh, the, the, the main crop of the island was coffee. Mm -hmm. And there was no expectation that coffee would fail, which it did in the next 10 or 15 years for various reasons. And so it so happened completely by accident that James Taylor had set up his tea field uh, got some experience in producing tea and also in exporting it. And that industry grew very rapidly till uh, the early 1900s. So in, in the next, basically in the next 35 years, it grew so rapidly that by 1900, we were exporting tea to Russia, to the United States, and also largely to England. Mm -hmm. um, and from then on, there was no looking back. Okay, so how are the celebrations going? As we understand that there are many activities taking place uh, all around the country to mark this uh, milestone. Sure. So there's celebrations happening here and also elsewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, on the 20th of last month, we celebrated the Global Tea Party, the world's largest tea party, mm -hmm. celebrated in uh, all the way from Fiji right the way to Chile on okay. the other side of the world. Uh, at the same time, in each time zone, there were hundreds of tea parties that took mm -hmm. place. Ordinary people getting involved, engaging with Ceylon tea to celebrate this legacy of 150 years. So, so that was quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, here in Sri Lanka itself, next week we have the Global Tea Convention mm -hmm. uh, happening. Uh, there's about 600 people who are going to uh, get involved in that from overseas and from Sri Lanka over a three-day period. That's mainly uh, to showcase developments in the field of tea, whether it's in the scientific side, the industrial, the marketing, and so on. Uh, then we've got uh, the tea exhibition, which covers also coconut and rubber, uh, starting on the 11th of, next, uh, of this month at the BMICH, uh, which will be an industrial exhibition, but also have uh, seminars on innovations in these fields so that people can become familiar with the directions that tea, uh, rubber and coconut are going to take in, in, in the coming years. So there's actually quite a lot happening. Right, very interesting. And if you look at uh, 
uh, the entire industry, uh, tea industry. Uh, can you talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about how the industry is progressing in terms of its volume, growth, and revenue? So, it, um, there's lots of different ways of measuring mm -hmm. industrial progress, but if you take the broad statistics. On, on some levels, um, we're going uh, down a bit, okay. and other levels, we're going up a bit. If you look over the last, uh, since the time I was a kid, mm -hmm. 1965, for example, we had about 240,000 hectares in tea. Okay. Now we're down to about 180,000, okay. quite a substantial decrease of about a quarter. Uh, tea production peaked in Sri Lanka in 2013 okay. uh, at about 340,000 uh, tons. Now we are down to about 285,000 tons mm -hmm. for various different reasons. Um, at the same time, the value of tea has increased, mm -hmm. but the growth that we've seen hasn't been nearly as much as was hoped for. Okay. So I think we've got work to do in, in, in the field of tea. Um, investment in the agricultural side has been declining for a long time now. Okay. The costs of labor have been increasing. Mm -hmm. So these are the challenges we need to overcome to see this industry through. Okay, so as uh, currently uh, you are the chairman of Sri Lanka Tea Board, so can you explain uh, the role of uh, Sri Lanka Tea Board in this context? So the uh, Tea Board does uh, three important things. It is the industrial regulator mm -hmm. that makes sure that standards are kept of the tea that comes to the auction in Colombo. So that, that tea has got to meet certain basic quality standards. We also regulate the quality of exports. And for this, we've got a, a, a really good laboratory service that makes sure that the tea we export is pure and that it has uh, no residues from pesticides and so on, or very, very manageable residues. And our third role is also to promote Ceylon tea across the world. So the tea board's been involved in that now for about four decades, uh, quite a long time. And we try to measure our success in how well known Sri Lanka tea or Ceylon tea is worldwide. Okay, and Ceylon tea is well known for its finest quality and its uh, distinctive taste. So. Uh, to ensure this quality, the entire process has to be monitored and uh, closely inspected as it's not just manufacturing, it's from manufacturing to blending to storing to packaging, that entire process has to be looked after. So how do you ensure quality uh, in this situation? So we've got a variety of standards and uh, hundreds of regulations mm -hmm. that, that oversee the quality um, assurance process at every stage. From the time the leaf is picked, we try to make sure that at least 60% of the leaf that's picked con consists of two leaves and a bud, mm -hmm. the basic okay. um, attribute of uh, good leaf quality. And all the way up to the point it gets on a ship, mm -hmm. uh, in managing humidity, uh, industrial residues, uh, mm -hmm. the quality of packing, and so on. Mm -hmm. Even the grade of inks that are used in the packing is something of relevance. Right, so uh, with that, uh, what makes Ceylon tea so unique? Is it the soil condition or weather conditions or is it a combination of things? What makes Ceylon tea so unique? So that's a trade secret. <laughs> okay, so I will not go further into no, it no, if no. so. We, we should talk about that. <laughs> okay. um, we've got this remarkable landscape we grow tea from pretty much at sea level, okay. in Gaul, for example, all the way up to almost 2,000 meters above sea level. So a variety of climatic zones, of soil types, um, and different manufacturing regimes. We have a huge diversity of tea factories, more than 700 mm -hmm. in production, and each one has its own secret. So the, 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 the huge variety we see of tea, both in terms of climate and region, because we've got seven regions which really create distinctive teas, like for example, Norelia, Udapusalava, Rohuna, Sabaragamo, and so on. Um, so we've, we've got this enormous variety of tea. And also we manufacture orthodox tea, which is a, a manufacturing process that results in a huge number of grades of tea. Mm -hmm. So you've heard of common things like uh, orange peco or mm -hmm. broken orange peco. There's more than 20 such grades. Okay. So this all provides a huge amount of diversity and competition in the field.
Okay, and at the same time, Kenya is also producing a tea which is quite close to Ceylon tea. And they are also coming into the market with low cost production. So in this situation, how do we handle competition uh, in the international market? That's a big challenge. Okay. So Kenya has grown and overtaken us in terms of volume of production. Okay. But our tea still gets a premium of about 40% in mm -hmm. terms of price. Okay. So we, we, uh, it's, it's a matter of concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's not immediate concern. Okay. Our challenge is to keep the value of Ceylon tea up by keeping the reputation of Ceylon tea up. Okay. You still don't see people going into a shop and looking for Kenyan tea. Mm -hmm. You do it's see them Ceylon going tea. in and looking for Ceylon tea. So Ceylon tea is the aspired tea that people who love tea try to drink. Okay, and there's also a big talk about importing tea from different uh, regions and blending with Ceylon tea and uh, exporting at a lower cost. I mean, this is, a, so, uh, this is a big talk going all around the industry and some are for it and some are against uh, for it. What are your thoughts? Well, I finally made my thoughts known yesterday in a newspaper article okay. after, after okay. more than a year and a half of thinking okay. about this issue and listening to all sides. I think that the time is not right now, but okay. I think there's a very good case for that argument. The truth is that even now, anyone can import uh, any tea to Sri Lanka so long as it meets basic quality standards and it's a, what they call a main grade of tea mm -hmm. and not an off grade. It can be imported even now mm -hmm. and blended, mm -hmm. but it's, if you're importing straight orthodox tea, which mm -hmm. is similar to the tea that we make. It's not okay. like the Kenyan and most of the Indian tea, which is the CTC okay. method of, proce uh, of processing. Okay. If you import orthodox tea, you've got to pay a 25% import duty, but you can still import it, we let you import it. Okay. But the demand for this has been very limited. Still, less than 1% of the tea that we export from Sri Lanka has been imported into Sri Lanka. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a very small, uh, part of the market that's been exploited up to now. Mm -hmm. The exporters for their part, or some of them, are asking to be able to hedge their, their pricing and to cushion their, their pricing by importing teas. Mm -hmm. But I'll give you a, a straight economic example. Last year, Sri Lanka's tea production, mainly because of drought but other reasons like the, the unavailability of uh, weedy sites, uh, dropped by 10%, give or take. Our prices rose by 45% last year. That shortage of tea in the market by 10% caused our prices to go up by 45%. Okay, All okay. Right. Now, if to make up for that 10% shortfall of tea locally, yeah. exporters were allowed to import that tea 10% from outside, mm -hmm. our prices wouldn't have gone up. Yes. Our manufacturers, our leaf growers would not have had the opportunity, opportunity. to make up the losses. So there's, there's a lot of complex economics here. And it's something that we have to do very incrementally, if at all. And I don't think the time is now. Mm, right. And at the same time, uh, our main tea exporting countries like Russia, Iran, Syria are having problems internally. They have political issues and economic issues going on in their country. So uh, how have these global issues affected the local tea industry? It's given us some tough times. We are stressed out in some markets, of course, because of different reasons. In Iran, they've been having trade sanctions for a long time. Uh, the Russian market has suffered from a weak ruble and made uh, imports very expensive. Uh, other markets like Turkey try to defend their local tea production by having very high tariffs. These are challenges that we've got to face, but our, our industry is incredibly innovative and resilient, and the exporters even in very difficult markets like Iran, do a, an incredible job. Okay. Last year, despite all the trouble there was in Turkey, which has been in the news, we increased our exports by almost 25%. Okay. It just shows that our people are really fantastic at doing this. And mm -hmm. often when I meet uh, the competition from countries like India or Kenya, they ask me, how do your exporters do this? Because we've been trying all this time, mm -hmm. but somehow they get out there and they sell. Uh, the, I think the, the secret is that there is a sense uh, of being able, of confidence and, and our people have the confidence. Uh, many of them have fluency in foreign languages. Uh, you, you meet people here who are, who are really aggressive about selling. And this is something you don't see in the tea industry in other countries. The marketing 
uh, ability. Okay, and um, having a 150 year old history, uh, Sri Lanka is still uh, producing and we account only for 10% or less than 10% of the world tea volume. What is stopping us? Uh, uh, why can't we stretch further? Is it because we are a small island and do we have capacity requirements? Uh, what are your well, thoughts? Well, that, that statistic is a little misleading really because the vast bulk of tea that's manufactured in the world is manufactured in China and India and consumed in those two countries. Mm -hmm. So if you look at exports, Sri Lanka is a much better position okay. than, than that. I don't think we can look at Ceylon tea in the context of a large volume industry. Okay. Uh, this is becoming a niche because we have to remember that Sri Lanka is becoming more prosperous. Okay. Uh, our per capita GDP is now about $4,000 a year. The per capita GDP of uh, Kenya is about $1,400, of India about $1,800, less than half of ours. So our cost of labor uh, as a result of that is growing very rapidly and becoming less and less affordable. And so unless we can sell tea at the premium high prices that we need, it's impossible for us to uh, really compete effectively in the global market. Okay. Okay, so soil conditions and weather conditions are quite vital for tea cultivation. But unfortunately, environmental con conditions have not been so favorable during the past couple of months. So how are we handling this situation in the tea industry and how do we manage climate change? This is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. I think climate change is the single biggest threat, uh, not just to tea, but to agriculture in Sri Lanka. And we still have a huge part of our economy that is dependent on agriculture. The, the problem really that we have to face is that this is not a linear progress. It's not like the whole country is becoming drier or warmer. Uh, it's just that in parts of the country we are seeing uh, declining rainfalls and increasing temperatures. For example, areas that we were taught about as being uh, very wet like Watawala, mm -hmm. uh, Watawala, Muskelia, Norton, Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. this traditionally wet area is now drying up quite fast. Okay. As a result of that, mm -hmm. tea production in the, in the highlands is declining quite rapidly because of drought, okay. because of uneven rainfall, fewer rainy days in the year. Mm -hmm. That's been compensated, for example, by areas like Colombo, which are having a lot more rainfall than they used to. Yes. So rainfall in Colombo has gone up by about 30% in okay. the last 60 years, mm -hmm. which is a huge increment. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to develop uh, new ways of growing tea, maybe looking at shade as an option to keep the tea cool. Um, we have to also look at new varieties of tea uh, that we can, we can grow that might be more tolerant of drought um, and also new areas in which to grow tea rather than the traditional ones. Okay, so we spoke a lot about tea, so I will ask you a different question. From the information we've gathered, your father is the oldest living planter in Sri Lanka and your grandfather too was a planter and you decided to be a biomedical engineer. However, ironically, today you are heading the supreme authority for Ceylon tea. How challenging has this journey been? Uh, the journey has not been challenging, it's been an easy one, I've been very lucky. Okay. But um, the challenge of the job is huge and the responsibility is huge. But the lovely thing about the tea board is that the, the board itself comprises largely of industry representatives. So we've got people from the smallholders, from the factory owners, the planters, uh, the traders, uh, the exporters and so on. And this uh, constituency is, is very powerful. So they sit on our board and they sit on many committees associated with the tea board. And it's the private sector that basically guides the tea board in how it conducts its business. So the only thing that the tea board really has to do is to do the administration, mm -hmm. but all the policy making and thinking and guidance I think comes from the private sector. And I'm very responsive to that. And I like the idea of that happening because our job is to serve the private sector. Our job is to be the servant of the exporters mm -hmm. and the producers mm -hmm. and make their life a bit easier. Okay. And that's what I try to do. Okay, lovely. And in your opinion, what are the critical issues uh, tea industry is facing right now which needs urgent attention? So I, I still think we can be a bit more efficient in the way in which we handle uh, uh, the way in which exports are checked, for example. Every tea export has to file a set of customs documents and samples are taken away and tested. And sometimes we are not fast enough and we need to improve our the way in which our laboratories work to do this. I think the agricultural side of tea is slipping back quite fast. Uh, this is not 
only a tea board issue, it's a national issue, that we're not reinvesting in replanting uh, tea. Uh, we've, uh, we've had an acreage that's been slipping for quite some years now, and the investment is huge. It costs about two and a half million rupees to replant a hectare of tea. And we have to look at replanting. Well, tea's got a 30 to 40 year, a tea bush has a 30 to 40 year lifespan. So we have to look at replanting about two and a half or three percent of our acreage every year. Okay. That means we should be looking at, at replanting maybe five or six thousand hectares a year. That's a huge investment, which is not happening right now. Okay. So before we wind up our conversation, can you talk a little bit about uh, the upcoming events at, uh, actually organized by the Sri Lanka Tea Board? As we understand, there are two major events taking place in the month of August. Yes. So the Tea Board is only supporting, as I said earlier, we try to have the private sector doing as much as possible. This is their industry. We are only there to guide them. And so the Colombo Tea Traders Association has organized uh, the Colombo Tea Convention which is happening at the BMICH from uh, the 9th to the 11th of this month. And then on the 12th and 13th, there is the Colombo Tea Festival, uh, which is a, a fun uh, series of events uh, of uh, street fairs, tea appreciation events, uh, a Mad Hatter's tea party and so on. All that's going to happen in, in, in the uh, Independence Arcade. Okay. And we'll, we're looking to have a fun time there. Okay. There's a lot of other side events. Uh, it's all on the radio and media right now, so I, I hope people participate. It's going to be a lot of fun. Right, so thank you very much, Mr. Pratyagoda, for joining us. It was lovely having you with us, and we wish you all the very best. Thank you. Right, with that, uh, we will move on to the Colombo Stock Market Update. So we have with us Mr. Sharaj Obesekar from Colombo Stock Exchange giving us an update on what is going on in the Colombo Stock Exchange. Good evening. Um, it's good to be back on the show and I'll first start by focusing on how the markets have performed today. Uh, the market ended on a mixed note today with the benchmark all share price index losing 19 points to close at 6,585.53 and the S&P SL20 index making a slight gain of 0 0.74 points to close at 3,789.83. When comparing how the stock market indicators have done so far this year, uh, 2017 has had a positive st story to tell so far. The All Share Price Index has made a 5.74% gain year to date, and the S&P SL20 index has also recorded an 8.39% gain so far in 2017. Uh, what is significant about this growth in the indices this year is that it reflects a turnaround in the declining uh, trend of, the, of both indices that were experienced in 2015 and 2016. Overall trading activity has also improved this year with the daily average turnover recorded for trading marking improvement to Rs 896.21 million, again improving from a figure of Rs 737 million in 2016. We have a positive story to tell also in terms of foreign invest activity and foreign investor participation in the market so far this year, uh, where we have recorded a net foreign inflow of 26.3 billion rupees year to date. Uh, this again, as I said, indicates a strong interest uh, in foreign investor participation in 2017. And in fact, just to give you some perspective of, of the kind of level of interest, foreign interest we've had this year, uh, the foreign purchasers we have seen in the two first half of 2016, that is January to June in 2016, that figure has been doubled so far uh, January to June in 2017. And we have seen an all-time high for foreign purchasers in the first half of a year, of a calendar year this year, uh, which again indicates a strong interest in how foreign investment participation has improved this year. And in another announcement that we just released, Yesterday, 2017 has also marked a record for investments coming in from Australia. A figure of rupees 626.4 million has come th through Australian investors up to date this year. This is a record for investment coming in from Australia for a calendar year, and we have uh, yet to finish the year as well, which is certainly encouraging. 
Um, to give you some perspective, again, the CAC and SCC conducted an invest Sri Lanka promotion in Australia and New Zealand this year, and remarkably, 95% of the investment that has come in from Australia has been since uh, we conducted the forums down under, which is certainly encouraging in terms of the foreign investor promotion effort that has been taking place. Um, and to just to give some perspective on how uh, local investors can benefit from the stock market performance so far this year, uh, the CSC and SEC uh, has initiated a series of investor dates um, around Sri Lanka to create awareness on opportunities in the stock market. And the series will ma be making its stop in Colombo on the 15th of August uh, at the Hilton Colombo Residencies. The Investor Forum is a free of charge event and is open for registration presently. More uh, details can be sought through the CSC website. And it is really a series where uh, an event where investors or whoever that is interested in the stock market can come and uh, learn about the concept of investing, meet stockbrokers, meet unit trust companies, speak to representatives of the stock exchange, and also hear from experts such as uh, Mr. Hasita Prevaratna and uh, Rabia Vesuria, who will be speaking on uh, the macroeconomic conditions and opportunities in the stock markets, respectively. So that event is taking place on the 15th of August at the Hilton Colombo Residencies, and once again, registration is free, and uh, more details could be obtained by visiting the CSE website on www.cse.lk. Uh, that does bring us to an end uh, of the update for this week. Have a pleasant evening. Good evening. Um, it's good to be back. On Thank you very much, Shiraj, for the update. And with that, we are ready to move on to our final segment for today. And we hope to talk about a very important industry in the financial sector, and that is non-banking finance industry that facilitates a wide range of uh, uh, fa financial services to the general public. And we have with us Mr. Dinesh Pereira, Chief Executive Officer of TKS Finance Limited, joining us for an in-detailed conversation uh, on this sector. A very good evening to you. Good evening, Isanga. Right. So, uh, first of all, can you briefly <coughs> give an overview of the non-banking finance industry in Sri Lanka? Yeah, the financial sector, if you uh, talk about the financial sector, there are few key elements. Uh, the main uh, sector is the banking sector, which is, the, of course, the largest. And then comes the non-banking finance uh, sector, which you uh, basically call as the finance companies and the leasing companies. Then you have uh, the other contractual savings organizations such as the insurance sector and also the EPF, ETF. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final uh, sector is the informal sector which, is, uh, which figures are not known but uh, is considered to be substantial in the Sri Lankan context and which you commonly uh, refer to as a black market. Okay. So, NBFI is part of the financial sector okay. and basically it consists of the finance companies and the leasing companies. Okay, and uh, can you elaborate on the term NBFIs further? Yeah, NBFI is a term used specially by the central bank to refer to the finance companies mm -hmm. and usually NBFI means non-banking finance institutions or finance industry. Okay. So, and there is a special uh, department, separate uh, department at the central bank who actually monitors this segment. So that is how this NBFI came into being. Okay, so if you look at the local market, uh, <coughs> how big is this industry? What are the volumes that we are looking at? Yeah, uh, basically if you uh, segregate uh, the industry or the balance sheet, mm -hmm. Sri Lankan balance sheet into sev uh, the separate uh, segments, mm -hmm. the banking uh, sector accounts for about 68% of okay. the entire volume, okay. which is about 10,575 billion. Okay. And uh, the huge. NBFI, that's yes, huge. that's the largest actually. So NBFI uh, accounts for 8.1% and uh, in rupee terms, it's about 1,246 billion. The specialized finance companies uh, and the leasing companies uh, specialized leasing companies account for about 3.4 percent, Nisanga, okay. and uh, which is uh, in rupee terms about 522 million. And contractual savings uh, organizations such as the EPF and the insurance sector accounts for 19.8 percent, 
which is 3040 billion uh, and of course the informal sector the figures are unknown mm -hmm. but it's also considered to be quite large okay so you've given us quite a comprehensive picture of the industry so uh, uh, can you also talk about the contribution that is coming from this sector to stimulate the economy yeah <clears throat> if you take the Sri Lankan economy especially Sri Lanka being a developing country uh, the entrepreneurs or the new people who want to be, start up a business uh, they hardly have the financial and uh, backup financial uh, uh, you know stability or the financial background okay. to start this okay. and uh, especially when they want to approach a bank mm -hmm. they find it difficult to match the standards uh, expected by the banks mm -hmm. so this is where the finance uh, finance institutions come in mm -hmm to help these people start up a business or be it a leasing facility, uh, be it for working capital or expand in the business by way of a property mortgage facility. Mm -hmm. So the role played by the financial institutions are especially at the grassroots level, even as uh, low as microfinance, like say providing facilities as low as 50,000 rupees. And uh, they, then once these customers are established then they gradually move on to the bigger banks mm -hmm. and you know so the role played in developing the economy by the finance companies i consider it to be very important because it is at the startup point okay so what are the security measures in place as uh, uh, we've come across <coughs> situations where uh, finance companies have collapsed and investors have lost their funds so in this situation, what are the regulatory measures in place to avoid uh, uh, those uh, situations and experiences, uh, the custom, I mean, uh, repeating such bad experiences? Yeah, non-banking finance industry is uh, specially uh, monitored and uh, actually it has to be first registered with the central bank and thereafter it is regularly monitored and by the central bank okay. so by way of you know calling for continuous regular reports mm -hmm. uh, site audits and uh, several uh, there are several ways that the central bank monitors okay. so at the moment i don't think there will be any issues at the moment mm -hmm. uh, and also in case there are issues there is a special deposit insurance scheme mm -hmm. uh, protecting the depositors so, all around the country, across the across entire across the country. financial industry, it is there in all finance companies. It is uh, monitored and regulated by the central bank, and there is a dip, the, that is up to a certain limit. The in, dep depositors are covered. Okay. So, in case there is some issue, they will be compensated through this fund. Okay. And uh, in terms of the finance companies, mm -hmm. also there are you know like uh, in case of a default. There are special ways and means, for example, you must have heard about seizing. Mm -hmm. So in case the vehicle, there is a uh, default on the vehicle, the vehicle could be repossessed. Okay. That is regulated. And also in terms of money recovery, uh, you know, those days uh, a recovery action used to take quite a long time, uh, maybe four to five years. But now with the Special Debt Recovery Act, mm -hmm. it is the procedure is quite short. So the recovery, uh, in that sense, the recovery could be done quite quickly. So both ways, even on the side of the depositor or the investor or on the side of the company, regulations and uh, the mechanisms are in place to have a smooth operation. Okay, and also can you talk about the different product segments uh, we find in this industry? Uh, the main uh, product category here is the leasing product, mm -hmm. which accounts for about 500 billion mm -hmm. in non-banking finance industry alone. Mm -hmm. It's about 500 billion mm -hmm. leasing. Then comes actually uh, the secured loans, okay. which accounts for about 400 billion, uh, where mostly these are secured against property mortgages. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there is the pawning, microfinance and all those uh, categories but those two the leasing and the secured loans against property mortgages are the largest okay so uh, since you spoke about leasing industry can you talk a little bit about how this industry is progressing in this particular sector yeah uh, 
Actually, earlier it was higher purchase, mm -hmm. and now it has been uh, converted to leasing. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, leasing, there are two types: maybe vehicle leasing and the machine leasing. Uh, the highest exposure in the non-banking finance sector is on the vehicle leases. Actually, vehicle leases progressed quite well. However, in recent times, with the high, uh, you know, price fluctuations and high prices. The leasing industry has been affected, okay. and also to a certain extent, the LTV has uh, controlled the growth in the vehicle leasing industry. Okay. So you can say like LTV. They, LTV. Can yes. you elaborate on that term? Uh, LTV. Uh, what you mean by LTV is the loan to value. Okay. Uh, for example, if it's uh, an unregistered vehicle like a car, van, or SUV. Mm -hmm. You can advance only up to 50% of the value. Okay. So that means if it's 10 million, you can give up to 5 million, and balance has to be borne by the customer. So the customers have to have 5 million in hand to buy a vehicle worth 10 million. So that is a controlling mechanism. However, uh, certain segments like the where the government wants vehicles, like for example, commercial vehicles, you can go up to 90%. Also, 100% in certain cases where it is used for certain purposes. So, LTV controls uh, you, uh, the vehicle importing to a certain extent and it has affected the leasing industry as well. Okay, so uh, if you look at microfinancing, can you define this sector and how could a person be eligible uh, to get uh, to come within this criteria and obtain a facility? Yeah, microfinance actually it's uh, basically if it's a self-employed self uh, category or maybe a household uh, industry which needs a little bit of money, maybe 50,000, 100,000, mm -hmm. small amounts like that. Mm -hmm and it is considered as a group because the amounts are quite small uh, about 20 30 people or more 50 people get together and uh, they have form a center mm -hmm. and then you go and service the people there in that uh, location through that center and that uh, group facility or the center facilitates the recovery as well okay. so there are inter guarantees mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they you know, guarantee each other okay. and it's like a group okay. and uh, so basically it's startup and very small scale industries like, you know, uh, home. Okay, yeah. uh, what is the security requirement for a microfinance Microfinance, uh, the finance company does not expect uh, security mm -hmm. uh, because other than the personal guarantees, mm -hmm of you know uh, inter it's like a inter guarantee you guarantee each other mm -hmm. and you do not expect any fixed security from the microfinance sector okay so what sort of support do you think is required to grow this sector yeah <clears throat> now as i said earlier the finance industry are the people who are uh, helping the people who start up so the uh, the inherent risk in a startup business is more for finance companies uh, whereas the banks you know they take mostly customers from the finance company so however in terms of recovery uh, banks are equipped with parate uh, execution and recovery tools which are not uh, uh, given to the finance company so in the future if the facilities like that is extended then maybe finance companies would want to take a little bit more risk okay. and help the customers. So okay. that those type of things would help the uh, finance companies in helping the customers better. Right. So thank you very much for joining us today. It was quite an intense conversation. We covered almost all the areas we wanted to cover today. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much, Isanga. Right. With that, we got to wind up for today. and. We will be back with you next week, same time on Channel Eyes. Until then, take care and good night.